So, since we advertised at this retreat, with this retreat we would use the Platform Sutra. <coughs> Again, the Platform Sutra is a teaching from the sixth ancestor master in the Chan lineage, Master Huynan. He lived around the seventh century. And as I, <coughs> as I mentioned this morning, he was one of the most influential Chan teachers. Some people here may have heard of Bodhidharma. Have you heard of that name before? Bodhidharma, Damo. Mm. And many people know of him through like Kung Fu movies. <laughs> you know, he's associated with Kung Fu in popular culture. But he was the recognized as the first ancestor teacher of Chan in China. <clears throat> However, his style, uh, his presentation of the teaching, and his grasp of language, it's safe to say that it wasn't as influential or as powerful as Master Huynan's. Not to say that Master Bodhidharma was lacking skills in teaching. He may have been lacking in some language skills because, as the legend goes, he was Indian. So Chinese was his second language, or not his native language at least. <coughs> and as the story goes, he didn't spend as much time <coughs> living close to people. He came to China as a monk. And when he arrived, and if you know the story, he wasn't so well accepted, or it seemed at the time that people weren't quite ready for what he wanted to bring, what he wanted to help people realize. <coughs> at the time when Bodhidharma was, uh, arrived in China, Buddhism was already gaining strength, starting to flourish, was supported by the emperor. It was the emperor's religion. So you can imagine it was quite widespread. <coughs> but still people weren't ready to receive his message, which is essentially the same message of Master Huynan, which is going directly to the point. Meaning, going directly to what is the problem? Why is it that we suffer? And what is the most direct way to stop that or resolve that? <coughs> it's the same age-old problem that the Buddha addressed, the problem of suffering. How do we do it? Well, we know that some traditions have a very um, uh, you could say a graduated path or a sequential path consisting of clearly demarked stages of progress <coughs> also consisting of methods that are very concrete methods such as breathing methods where we first gather in the scatteredness of our mind concentrate it develop stability. It's referred to as samadhi. Stability of mind, equality of mind, and also in some traditions going deeper into the absorption of the mind, into one object, and even into the internal object of the most subtlest kind of mind state. <coughs> and as many of you know, in the Buddhist tradition, there are methods of mindfulness, often called foundations of mindfulness, where the practitioner observes different aspects of the body and mind, starting from the most coarse, physical body, state of the body, moving to the finer aspects of thought, mental activity, finer thought activity. <clears throat> and through a process of observation, 
a person can gain an insight into the nature of these phenomena. Basically, that our body and mind is constantly changing. A fact that is so incredibly simple. And most of us can probably accept it right off the bat, right? Our body and mind is changing. Would someone stand up and say, no? Maybe they would. Maybe there would be something that they would claim to be unchanging. <coughs> Maybe it's one of those finer things, finer aspects of mind. Some people claim it's a soul of some kind. That's at least that is not changing. At least that, at least that, we can call ourselves. Through the Buddha's observation and through these practices of mindfulness, you directly observe every state that arises and experience its change. Not believing that it's changing, experiencing directly that all the phenomena of body and mind, feelings, uh, hard, more substantial form of the body. <coughs> hard form of the body, the feelings, thoughts, anything that arises as impermanent. With those methods, for the most part, they can be, <coughs> they can be complicated in a sense that the path to samadhi requires a lot of uh, attention to detail and effortful concentration. In order to absorb your mind, we need to use effort to absorb it into something. That takes a lot of effort. It takes a certain kind of conditions to do that. Often very simple life and conditions to do that. <coughs> the um, Some practices of mindfulness can also be quite detail-oriented where, in addition to observing the phenomena, it may require that the practitioner does a certain kind of analysis. Analyzing, for example, that the, <coughs> that the body is impure. Basically, our body has lots of problems. It's not perfect. It has lots of pains and ailments and imperfections, even in the healthiest of body. That requires a kind of analytical thinking, or a certain degree of discriminating thought. <coughs> uh, discriminating thought meaning words, concepts, and language to assist the person with the contemplation. It's, it's in a sense directing the mind in the contemplation. <coughs> and so on. I won't go through all of them. But often it's the case that this requires a certain degree of uh, analytical thinking, discrimination, in order to engage in that kind of observation. <clears throat> the basic approach of the Chan school is the same in that it's developing stability, stability of mind, keeping the mind from scattering, drifting. It's also developing insight. If it wasn't, it wouldn't be Buddhist. It's developing the ability to perceive the nature of the body and mind. And we can also say the basic nature of mind itself. <coughs> However, the part that's different is that with Bodhidharma emphasized, which is also the Buddha's teaching, one form of teaching, is that it can be a very direct approach to insight of the nature of the mind. If the person's conditions are right, they can skip over any kind of discriminating thinking or analysis. They can do away with that. 
they can also do away with absorption. Although it's very useful, very powerful, it's not necessary for insight to occur. Absorption is not necessary for insight. According to the teaching of sudden insight, or what's called sudden enlightenment, or dun wu in Chinese, the teaching of Duan Wu is often uh, seen in sutras like the Sutra of Complete Enlightenment. Have you heard of that? It's on the rack there. It's there. Sutra of Complete Enlightenment. It's also the Vilmakirti Sutra. Have you heard of that one? And even in the earliest, so-called earlier collections of the Agamas or Nikayas, we see there are many disciples who just upon hearing a certain word or upon having a certain experience, they suddenly dropped all of the problematic thinking and attachment that leads to suffering. Like uh, the great disciples, Shariputra, it's a household name possibly for Buddhists, Shariputra. What was his Dharma's brother's name? Uh, was it Mahakashapa? Mahamogalana. Mahamogalana. Um, and figures like them had sudden insights. But I guess it's important to note that they had been practicing meditation for quite some time. They had mastered a certain form of meditation. It's possible that it was absorption. But their insight came about just in an everyday situation. I think one situation was a Shariputra who was fanning the Buddha. The Buddha was giving a talk. One of his disciples was fanning some kind of this giant leaf fan. And the Buddha asked him a question, if I remember that correctly. The Buddha asked him a question, and suddenly, his mind shifted from grasping, attachment, anger, greed, ignorance, all of it, still there, to dropping it. Having a sudden experience of a mind without suffering. So this is the principle of the Chan teaching. It's often uh, emphasized the sudden insight. So, from Bodhidharma to Master Huenam, this is the spirit, or this is the, you could say, the uniqueness of the Chan school. However, again, it has the shared aspects of that a person still needs the foundation of mental stability, mental clarity, <coughs> for any kind of insight to occur. It certainly doesn't mean like McDonald's enlightenment, where you drive in, you push a button, or you, you hear a word, can I take your order? And all of a sudden, a person is just liberated. It requires practice. It requires the conditions of a stable body and mind. So sudden doesn't mean easy. Sudden doesn't mean without any sort of preparation or condition. It just means there is a direct way to insight. So, Mestre Huineng, being born in China, grew up within the culture. He was a layman until I think he was around his early 20s. He understood the culture very much and the language. So when he expressed the teaching, it really impacted people. And this is why he became so well-known and so influential. And that from generations after him, Many of the Chan masters would borrow his style of uh, teaching, speaking, and helping people, not only through speech. <coughs> so, <coughs> the text that I brought today comes from the Platform Sutra, again, the Liu Tzu Tanji. This version is um, it's a version that was revised by Master Yin Shun. Does anybody know of him? 
a great Buddhist scholar, passed away around the year 2000. He revised this text because the Duanhuang version of the sutra, actually found in caves 100 years ago, it was actually a hand copy version with mistakes all over it. It was actually comical how many mistakes there were. And it was likely that it was copied by someone who couldn't really read. They were just trying their best to copy what they could see. So it needs revision to understand it. And he revised it based on comparisons to other sutras. For you scholars, I'm just giving you side notes if you're interested. <laughs> if you don't care about this, who cares? Just ignore that. But it comes from the Duanhuang version, and it's section four. The section, one of the sections on practice. <clears throat> this is part of a lecture that Master Huinang gave to uh, a large audience during a, a refuge taking ceremony. So he was surrounded by thousands of people taking refuge in Buddhism, and most of the people there were lay people. So he was addressing them. So this section talks about three main principles. One is called, another side note for the scholars, before I get to the content. This is probably one of the trickiest sections of the sutra to translate from Chinese to English. For those of you who speak Chinese, you'll know why. Um, for those of you who have maybe read many versions, you may also wonder why they can be so different. And the reason is that the Chinese language has so many subtle nuances to it. And it's such a flexible language. One character could mean many different things. For example, the character that's normally translated into English as thought the Chinese word is nian. It's often translated as thought and translated as thought in every instance that it appears in this section. However, the Chinese word nian, the same nian as zheng nian, or the same nian as mindfulness, that nian by itself can mean mindfulness, which doesn't necessarily have to have thought along with it. It can mean mindfulness. Two of them put together, nian nian, can mean time. Sense of time, moment after moment. Nian nian, something something. Nian nian, something something. It's a sense of time, or a moment in time. <coughs> Since Chinese is also a very simplified, condensed language, and Master Huinang, you know, just uh, being born in that culture and using the simplest of terms, you need to remember that there may be another character before that, invisible, so to speak. There's a lot of understood characters that don't appear. That, in a, a Western language or a Latin-based or Sanskrit root language, all the details are spelled out very clearly. You folks who here are, are, are studying Pali, right? Or Sanskrit. These are very precise languages. Everything is spelled out. Nothing is missing. And every detail is noted. The English language can be like that. <coughs> the Chinese language, especially during this time, and especially when recorded in sutras, is not like that. <laughs> Chan masters, even less precise. <laughs> and there's a purpose. The Chan teaching was to go beyond discriminating thinking, to go beyond intellectualizing and possibly becoming caught up in concepts, especially <coughs> concepts of Dharma. Why would they go to great lengths to be too precise and get everybody <laughs> caught? So the language, if we just understand the spirit behind this teaching, the language of Master Huinan is to help to cut away 
that ceaseless churning of the thinking mind. Even the scholastic or practitioner Buddhist introspective mind, which can be full of a lot of dukkha, this and that, and sukkha, whatever, terminology, terminology which really becomes dukkha, which becomes a source of suffering, overthinking, overanalyzing. So the spirit of this text, cut through discrimination. It's a take a leap beyond the conceptual mind. So why be precise, you know? <laughs> also, Huinan was speaking to an audience of people who were very dedicated to practice. There were also, in addition to there being scholars, very well educated people in the audience, there were also meditators, say professional meditators, either monastics or lay people who dedicated a lot of their time to sitting meditation. And many of you know that when you hear the word Zen, what Zen often associated with Sitting meditation. Maybe that's what pops into mind, the picture of someone sitting in meditation. Zen. Zen, Chan tradition. Yes, it does emphasize sitting meditation as a core practice. What's interesting is that there's no record of Master Huina meditating. He doesn't talk about, well, when I meditate, I do this, or when you meditate, you should do this. First, adjust your posture then relax your body, then harmonize your breathing, focus on your breath. None of that is mentioned or recorded. <coughs> One reason is that the <coughs> professional meditators or the experienced practitioners, they know all that. There's no need to have like beginner's meditation class recorded in the, the sutra. So these people had a solid foundation and understanding of how to meditate. And many of them had strong samadhi power for deep experience in absorption. So he was also addressing their problem, which could be what? What's the problem? What's the problem if you could really get deep into meditation? Say again? Anger. Anger? <laughs> Complacency? Yeah. Attachment to blissful meditative states. Yeah? I think you folks are sharp. <laughs> <laughs> you know this already. Actually, all of those answers, even anger, which you may at first think, why would the person be angry if they can have strong, concentrated power? They can. Because a very powerfully concentrated mind, if it doesn't like distraction and you distract it, it will become angry at you. <laughs> if we like our meditation state so much, and our roommate comes in, slams the door, throws the books down, or throws whatever down, starts to open the fridge, or do whatever, and we don't like it, then our seed of anger arises. <clears throat> There's also another problem. What could be a problem um, if we sit a lot However, we don't necessarily have, have the familiarity with the method. We're not so skilled with it, so we can't get into samadhi. But maybe our body doesn't bother us, so we can sit for hours. What could happen in that kind of situation? That's a kind of danger. Anybody know? Is it dullness? Yeah, exactly dullness or a kind of stupor of the mind where the body can sit perfectly perfectly still almost perfectly straight <coughs> but the mind could be so dull that the person doesn't know they're meditating anymore they could be sleeping could doze off I've seen a lot of 
very experienced practitioner is very good at sleeping while sitting straight up. <laughs> so during retreat, you can't tell. It's like, wow, they were sitting there for two periods. But then in an interview, they share that, well, you know, I just, I don't, I don't know what's happening, actually. It just feels, feels okay. That's all they can say. I guess it just feels okay, but then all of a sudden I hear the chime, and it's like, whoa, what was happening? So they weren't aware at all of the process of stabilizing of the mind. They weren't aware of the process that, of course, there's going to be distractions, there's going to be feelings. The mind was so dull that nothing registered. And that's a kind of, that can be a huge obstacle for meditators. <coughs> and for some people, they would not admit it. It's like, well, I'm, I'm meditating. I'm just sitting, sitting straight up. I feel good. What's the problem? Because you feel good afterwards. You feel really good. Because it's like, it's the most perfect nap. Because <laughs> you're unaware of anything. You're not even aware of sounds or disturbances. The body feels very calm because it's relaxed. So when you come out of a, a dull meditation, you may still feel refreshed. So there is a kind of benefit there that may trick a person into thinking that they're actually meditating, where they're just dull. <coughs> so these are actually the conditions and the people that Master Huaining was speaking to. I'm spending a lot of time introducing this because if we don't know the context, we don't really know what the meaning of this is. We don't talk about the context, or the conditions, the audience. Dharma has no meaning. So, um, scholars thinking too much, or just Buddhists ruminating over the Dharma. Too much. Meditators either enjoying samadhi too much or becoming dull, blank. And the blankness of mind, <coughs> <coughs> blankness of mind sometimes can be referred to as a, a thoughtless state, especially in the Chinese language. And if you look at meditation records, uh, whether they're Buddhist or non-Buddhist, uh, the words wu, wu nian, wu xin, wu, meaning sometimes nothing, or absent, something being absent. Nian, meaning mind or mental activity. A person could hear that terminology and or use that terminology meaning a state of mind which is just thoughtless, could be wu nian. And there's even some stages of samadhi which are translated into the term is wu shan, wu shan ding. The samadhi or the concentration without perception. Meaning there's no thought of any kind. <coughs> so a person could think that hmm, purpose of meditation is to have no thoughts. I want no thoughts. And maybe we want that because <laughs> thoughts can be so troublesome. We have so many thoughts, we think, okay, if I just meditate well, I will have no thoughts. And if that's the goal, we could easily mistake dullness. <laughs> dullness for enlightenment or insight. Because dullness, we're not aware of anything. It seems like there's nothing happening, no thoughts. We could mistake samadhi for insight. So, with that said, now we know who he's talking to. The section of this text uh, begins like this. <coughs> I'll just read the English this time, because um, even if you understand Chinese, you would probably need the text in front of you to understand all the characters because it's so simplified. 
So, Master Huynam says, My virtuous friends, this approach of mine from the very beginning, whether it's sudden or gradual, it establishes being without thought as the principle, being without form as the substance, and being without abiding as the basis of awakening, the basis of insight. may sound like it just contradicted what I said, but we'll go over it. Without thought, without form, without abiding. And he goes on. So what does it mean to be without form? And form here, Chinese term xiang. Form, I believe the... Um, Sanskrit is lakshana. It just means any kind of, could be a physical form, solid physical matter. It could be a sensation. Sensation is also a form that we experience, a feeling. It could be a thought. Thoughts are also forms, They're mental forms, images or words. Any object of our experience Sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, thought. They're all forms. What does it mean to be without form, he says? Be detached from forms while in the midst of them. So it doesn't mean to not feel anything, not experience anything doesn't mean to go to a state where we're blank, without thought and feeling. It means in the very experience of any feeling, any object or idea that comes into mind, just don't get stuck on it. Or, as the title of today's sutra is, is it never mind, uh, today's retreat? Never mind? Do you wonder why I use that term? And I tried to use it a few times this morning. Did you catch that? <laughs> when a painful feeling arises, when we're meditating, never mind. It's quite different than, oh my God. <laughs> what's, what's this? Say again. Say relaxation. Right. But sometimes we react to feelings with an oh no response, which is rejecting it. Oh my god, pain again. I just started. We just started the session. I can't start with pain. How could I sit through the whole session with pain? It's just a form, a feeling, but already we've generated what here refers to which is thought. We've generated discriminating thoughts about the form that we encounter. A harmless form. Yes, pain hurts. You could say forms are harmless. In the face of a well-trained mind, any form is danger if our mind is not trained, not aware. So we usually react with that, oh no. Or if it's good, like if it's like you said, relaxation. It's like, nice, feels good. Starting this retreat, good, I like this. Let's keep it going, <laughs> keep this feeling. And if it is a very unusual feeling, something we would never feel you know, in daily life, in a scattered state of mind, a lot of the feelings <coughs> A lot of the feelings experienced in meditation, like you folks mentioned, the bliss of meditation, that's not a feeling that we would experience with a scattered mind. It won't happen with a scattered mind. With a concentrated mind, it does. Feelings of bliss, feelings of pleasure, are also forms. If in the face of that form we generate discriminating thought, the grasping towards it, 
then immediately that's trouble. Immediately the mind is disturbed. <coughs> so right after saying without form, he continues with, being without thought is having a mind without discriminating thoughts. We're clearly aware. The mind should be clearly aware of sitting or of working, walking, but especially in sitting. It has to be clear that we are sitting. That's referred to as nian, or mind, awareness. We want that. That's important. Otherwise, it becomes dullness. We don't need words, language, judgments, discriminations, all of this extra stuff, all these extra reactions to our experience, they disturb disturb the mind. So again for the, for the scholars or for the Chinese speakers, this phrase is very interesting. Being without thought is having a mind without discriminating thoughts. The Chinese is just yu nian er bu nian. Yu nian. It's confirming there should be nian. There should be awareness. Er bu nian. But without thought, without all that extra discrimination, busyness of mind. Fairly clear, huh? In the John tradition and the method we've been using this morning um, is yunian or wunian to have a mind without discriminating thoughts. All morning we were just sitting, just simply aware of sitting. <coughs> There's awareness, but we're cultivating silence. Are there thoughts? Of course, thoughts are gonna float through. One, one situation is that we're aware the whole time. Our awareness is seamless, and thoughts kind of float through. We're aware of them floating through, but we never mind, don't mind them. We don't need to go look at them. Oh, what is that? What thought is that? Oh, there's another one. Hey, wait a second. That kind of reactive mind to thoughts. Oh, there's another one. Shouldn't be there. We don't need that. Thoughts pass in, don't mind them, they pass out. And our awareness is seamless, continuously aware. That could be one situation. <coughs> Another situation, which is probably most of our situation, is that we're going to forget that we're sitting. From, I'm aware that I'm sitting, I'm aware that I'm sitting. Clearly aware that I'm sitting, all of a sudden, you know, we're back at work. We're back at home. Or we're back five minutes ago and something not so pleasant happened. Or jumping ahead a few minutes or a few hours to something else. That's <coughs> For most of us, that's going to happen. We'll lose awareness and start to follow these wandering thoughts, uh, passing thoughts, meandering, lost in them. <coughs> so there is thought arising. We can't deny that. But what do we do? Once we notice that, it's actually already passed. Like for example, right now, if you were just to notice, what thoughts are passing through your mind? You don't have to look at me, just let your eyes relax. What thoughts are passing through your mind? happens when we notice the thoughts. Anybody experience a moment of noticing the thought pass and having a bit of silence? 
gap of mental silence, even for a moment? Anyone? <coughs> as soon as there's awareness of that passing thought, it's actually the tail end of it. It's already passed. There's no need to do anything extra to to stop it. <laughs> it's already gone. It's almost like kicking somebody out of your house who's already on their way out. You don't have to say anything. They're already leaving. They get the point. <laughs> we look at them. It's like we look at them and they're like, all right, see you tomorrow. With just awareness or recognition of that wandering thought or that uh, current of wandering thoughts, it passes. <coughs> And we're left with even just a moment of awareness and at the same time silence or the absence of those attachments. So <coughs> there's a, a phrase that describes this approach to practice and it's called silent illumination. Mo Zhao. You heard of that? Silent illumination. <coughs> which the illumination just means clearly aware in the concept, context of sitting, clearly aware that the body is sitting. That's illumination. Clearly aware that a thought has just passed through the mind. That's also illumination. Clearly aware that my legs are killing me or there's some kind of discomfort. That's illumination. <coughs> Silence is just not doing anything extra. It's just not adding any extra reaction. No need to push it. No need to try to stop anything. No need to try to keep anything. That's silence. So in the beginning we may find that, yes, our body is probably one of the biggest sources of distraction in meditation, especially in the beginning. It's this thing, this heap of bones and flesh that if we're not used to sitting, it's going to hurt. Or if we haven't been taking such good care of it, it's going to feel bad. <laughs> it's going to feel bad. <coughs> if we take good care of ourselves, we get enough sleep, get enough exercise, all those things that we all know we should do, but find difficulty doing it. And we're accustomed to sitting. The body won't produce so many different feelings, especially not the uncomfortable feelings. What then we may have to deal with is the comfortable feelings that we like too much. So regardless, in the face of any physical, more physical feeling, of pain or pleasure, or a mental experience, any kind of positive or negative thought. Silent illumination. We're clearly aware of it. There's nothing else to do with it. It passes. We experience its impermanence, its change, without forcing anything. <coughs> <clears throat> this is really the spirit of this whole section. I won't need to continue, and it's, it's too much, too much talking. But this is really the spirit of this teaching. We don't need to think about Buddhism, think about the Dharma in this form of practice. We don't need to use on a force and we don't even need to focus or concentrate on one kind of object all we need to do is just shift our attitude not fight with anything we experience not chase after what we experience just relax and be aware of sitting just relax be aware of walking, drinking. This is the sudden approach to practice.
if we were able to do this completely, wholeheartedly, seamlessly, from moment to moment, you'd experience insight of the Buddha. You'd experience everything in front of you, inside and out, is impermanent. There's no self there to get so get so worked up about. If we can't, no problem. If it's not so sudden, no problem. This just means that we practice more. It means that the gradual part of the practice is still there. We work on relaxation. We work on recognizing a lot of the anger or resistance we have. Recognize the resistance. Let it pass. That's also a gradual thing. And that's what we're here to do. I hope. Are you here to do that? Okay. So let's continue with the silent practice. <clears throat> 